Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Winter Speaker Series here at Nepean Sailing Club. Um, this will be our, it sounds negative, but this is our second last one, but that's kind of good. We've had a great run, and uh, we're saving the best till the, the end. Uh, Barry. Barry's career has spanned 34 years as a marine surveyor, uh, coupled with his other experience as a marine, former marine owner, marina owner, delivery captain, passionate boat owner. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge and experience, and Barry's gonna frame that up with his talk tonight on uh, buying a, a boat, the do's and don'ts. But uh, Thank you for uh, coming out on a rather, uh, what would we call tonight and tomorrow? We don't want to know about it, so uh, thanks for coming. Uh, just to add um, on, I'm a maritimer, born and raised in Nova Scotia. Um, my dad and my uncle were the founding members of the Dartmouth Yacht Club, which is now one of the biggest yacht clubs in the Maritimes. I started working on boats when I was 13 years old. Of course, this was back in the early 60s, and uh, they were all wood at that time, so I sure learned how to scrape and paint and sand and, and that sort of thing. And I uh, worked in the, uh, the yacht club and the marina right until I was 20 years old, and then I went into the RCMP for 28 years. And I got to work on the uh, RCMP police boat in Niagara Falls, enforcing the Small Vessels Regulations Act. Then I spent uh, two and a half years in the International Smuggling Squad, um, searching uh, the big Lakers uh, for contraband uh, coming through the port of Toronto. So I've, I've been around boats all my life. I bought my own very first boat when I was 27. And uh, here I am 74 and still a boat owner. So I got into surveying in 1990, um, which is 34 years ago because a friend at the marina where I was at, up on the Big Rito, got this form from an insurance company that he knew nothing about. And uh, he said, I got this from my insurance company. Can, he said, you know a lot about boats. Can you fill it out for me and sign it? And I said, well, I said, I don't know if they'll accept anything, but I said, I'll contact them and I'll send them a short resume. And, uh, that's how I ended up starting surveying. So uh, it's, I've surveyed over 2,000 boats uh, in my 34 years. I'm starting to slow down a bit, uh, only doing about 50 to 60 a season now, and uh, that sort of stuff. Also, I've had the pleasure of being a delivery captain on a number of boats, uh, four trips to Florida, six or seven trips down the Hudson to New York City. So out as far, as far south as Fort Lauderdale, as far northeast as Bar Harbor, Maine. So I've been very fortunate to cover the whole east coast. Now, <clears throat> surveying. Uh, yeah, surveyors, I don't know. People love them, people hate them. But somebody's got to do the job. Um, there's three types of surveys. There's what you would call a pre-purchase survey on a boat if you're interested in buying it. Uh, there is a pre-sell survey if you're thinking about selling your boat and you want to find out what condition it's in before you put it up for sale. Uh, a guy like myself would come along and certainly let you know what's right and what should be fixed up. And then there's the very, very common surveys today called the insurance survey, which I'm doing more of each and every year. The reason for that is the boats are getting older every year. There's some boats out here that CSs, CNCs, uh, uh, Aloha that were built on Whitby, you know, so, some of these boats were built in the 70s very solid fiberglass boats, no core in the hull bottoms, and they're still in very good condition. But once a boat, for some insurance companies, once a boat is 15 years old or 20 years old, they want an insurance survey, which is basically an inspection 
of the complete boat, out of the water. As you can see here, um, the most, I start from the bottom up. Now, I don't know how I got that right margin there, but uh, let's see if I can get rid of it. Hey, God, I never. <laughs> yeah, the bottom of the boat, very important. If the bottom's no boat, no good, your boat's going to sink. And uh, the first thing I look at the bottom of a boat is I look at the cradle. I look at how well it's supported. This particular boat, which is a boat from the club here, uh, it's got four, one, two, three, three on the other side, and it's got full keel support. It's very important to have your boat supported a lot of the weight on the keel, because if you don't, then you can have too much pressure on one pad and it would cause saucering or an indentation on the bottom of the boat. And I've seen some pretty ugly ones. So I also like to look at the, the, how the cradle is, uh, is built and uh, if it's nice and strong. Now, I work from the bottom of the keel up. I'm, I'm inspecting the keel. I'm inspecting if, if there's been a grounding even a, a small grounding of the keel on the bottom, there'll be a little bit of damages here because most keels are lead and lead is a very soft metal. So you can see a little bit of damage or indentation. Uh, the next thing I like to look at <clears throat> is what they call right here is the keel seam. This is where the keel of the boat is attached to the bottom of the boat. And there's great big bolts that go up through the bottom and then they're uh, bolted on the inside. The keel seam of a boat is important to look at. Sometimes they need maintenance. Uh, you know, if you've knocked the bottom a little, it could just jar the keel a little bit, just enough to crack the gel coat that's covering the seam and you should patch it because if not, you can get water seeping in between the top of the keel and the bottom of the hull and the water will run up the threads on the bolts. And if you look in your bottom of your boat and if you have an inch and a half of water there, it could be from the keel uh, or the bolts, the keels and bolts. Um, now my, uh, my favorite weapon of choice for sounding out the bottom is this kind of a hammer. It's not a metal hammer, it's a plastic hammer. One's quite hard, one's fairly soft. It's called a parabolic hammer and a lot of the marine surveyors use these for tapping the bottom of the boat. If there's <clears throat> any voids which are air pockets, it will give a different sound. If there's any excess moisture in the bottom, it will give a much softer sound than it would, um, oh, rather, if, it, if this is, I'm looking for that vibration when I sound the bottom. I'm looking for the bounce in my hammer because that tells me what I'm hitting is nice and hard and it's, it's bouncing back. I've tried using moisture meters. Um, I'm not personally as a surveyor, I'm not a big fan of moisture meters. Every boat has some moisture in it and you can't get too upset if it's got 10, 15% moisture in it. What I'm also looking at on the bottom, which we don't see much of up here, is osmosis, which are blisters on the bottom of the boat. They, usually occur in more warmer waters than we have up here. And with boats staying in the water year round, South Carolina, North Carolina, Florida, the Bahamas, sometimes these boats only come out of the water once every two or three years to have their bottom painted and uh, this sort of thing. Uh, gel coat, is somewhat of a porous material 
And if it's in the water long enough, it will absorb a bit of water. If the water gets between the gel coat and the raw fiberglass of the hull, which is a solid fiberglass, it, it can create, it can start to push out and you'll get these little blisters on the bottom of the boat. I, uh, I don't see it much here. The reason why is we have such a short damn season. You know, our boats, I've got it down to 18 weekends a year myself. You know, um, some of these boats are only in the water for <clears throat> five months. Uh, of course, it's a mad rush from the May 24th weekend until after Labor Day. People with uh, children that sail, the kids are back in school, they're trying out for the hockey team, the soccer team, the football team. You know, having owned a marina, it's like shooting a gun down in the middle of an empty street after, after the uh, Labor Day weekend. So, yeah, but it's one of the greatest uh, recreational, social activities that I've ever belonged to. So, and I'm still a boater. Um, now, once I inspect the hull, and also I'm looking at the sides of the hull, and um, what I'm looking for is any damage, any signs of previous repairs. The best fiberglass person in the world can do a nice repair and it looks perfect. A year and a half later, the gel coat has turned a little bit of a different color because as gel coat cures and ages, it can change its color a little bit. So you can pretty well tell. Um, also, I take a picture like this and make it as part of the survey, um, that sort of thing. Now, you can see here, if I uh, go over here, this is another shot from the other side of the boat, uh, looking at uh, the, the glossy side of the hulls, again, looking for any damage. Uh, that, uh, now, here's a, a close-up shot of uh, the bottom. Now, this was done when the boat came out in the fall, and, uh, you know, the bottom paint's peeling a little bit here and there, so one of my minor findings was the bottom paint should be touched up in the spring before it goes back in the water. I am a big believer, personally, in anti-fouling bottom paint, um, especially for sailing, because it keeps your boat clean, makes it perform and sail better. As well, it is a water repellent as well and it will repel water from getting into the gel coat if your boat was sitting uh, for a long time in the water, which isn't the case here. Now, you, let's see here. Running gear, very important. Prop, the condition of the prop, always check the lock nut, in here, for those that you don't know, there is a bearing, a rubber bearing, that goes inside this strut. It does wear out after a while, and it, what water goes through these rubber grooves in the bearing, and that's what cools your shaft from getting hot inside the strut. Also gives you the opportunity to check your zincs as well up there. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, problems with zincs here. Um, you know, if, if you see on your boat that your zinc is getting eaten up every year or two, um, it could be the sign of stray electrical current coming over from another boat that's prop, not properly grounded. Now, I think there's a lot of, there's not a lot of hydro in the docks here, is that correct? Yeah, there's no hydro, so you don't have to worry about that. 
but some of these bigger marinas, they've got 30 and 50 amp service and people are running their air conditioners. And if, if the boat isn't grounded properly, it can send an electrical current over. That's why they call these sacrificial anodes. And uh, also um, what I always do is I always turn the prop a few times and give it a little shake to see if it rattles. If it rattles a little bit inside the strut, again, that's the sign that the, uh, the bearing, the strut bearing may be wearing. And what's a real good sign is if you're going out to harbor at idle speed and you just sort of give it a gas, and if you feel just a little vibration and then it starts to go smooth, that can be another sign that you may need a, a strut bearing. But um, okay, so that's basically what I'm looking at for the underside of the boat. And it really, it really doesn't matter um, what kind of a survey I'm doing. This, this is the process that I follow. I will not survey a boat, I will not put my name on a survey if I don't see the boat out of the water. How can I say if the bottom's any good? How can I say the keel seems good? How can I say the running gear is in good repair? So if selling a boat, it's normally up to the buyer to pick whatever surveyor or whoever they want to survey the boat, um, if you're buying a boat. Um, there's so many things on a boat as well, even as a surveyor. I can report what they are in the report. I can say that they appear to be in good shape, but when you buy a boat, it has to have a satisfactory water test once the boat is put in the water. If you're not um, really boat savvy, but if you have a friend that is, bring them along or ask them to come and do the water test. The owner should be there as well. And uh, during the water test, there's a lot of things you should be looking at, uh, this sort of thing which I can get into a little bit later. Um, rudders. Oh, rudders. Rudder be damn, I'll tell you. Now right up here, where you see that L shape, backward L shape, there is a bearing. That bearing doesn't last forever, and sometimes it leaks. And where does the water go? It goes in your rudder, because a rudder is hollow. I have seen rudders that have been completely busted open from water being in there, freezing over the winter, expanding and cracking the rudder. So what I'm looking for what a lot of people do is right at the bottom of the rudder, they'll drill a small little hole with a drill to check to see if there's any water in the rudder. And then in the spring, they just take a little bit of marine tech and fill that hole. It's better to do that than to have your rudder all full of bulges and cracks and, and this sort of thing. It's, it's quite a job to take the rudder off, especially as you can see, you would not be able to get the rudder off without having the boat lifted up in the air unless you were to dig about a four foot hole so that you could drop the rudder in. So again, the rudder is a very important part of the boat and uh, it, should, it should be painted too. And it's one of the lowest parts of a boat. As you can see, this one here has probably been you know, drag through some sand or this sort of stuff. Um, propane. There's nothing wrong with having propane on a boat as long as it's been installed properly. Uh, you'll see here, it's got a gauge that tells you how much, you're, how much is in the tank. It also has an automatic shut-off solenoid switch that shuts the gas off at the tank 
and there's also an on-off switch at the stove inside the cabin so that when you're finished your cooking or whatever, you push that red button, you let all the, it shuts it off at the tank so the rest of the gas in the line burns out and your tank is shut off. Uh, they started making these compulsory back in the mid 80s, somewhere around there. There's still a lot of boats that don't have those on them. Um, and it's up to the captain, once they've used their propane, to go back to the tank and shut it off at the tank. And your propane locker should also be vented so that if there's any fumes or any leaking or anything, that it's got somewhere to escape to. And that's usually right in the back of the locker, or back of the, uh, the cockpit. There's, they usually have a locker on one side or a locker on the other or one in the middle where your propane tank is. I, I look at the propane tank, I look at the fittings, but I can't take the whole boat apart to trace the line. It's usually a very heavy uh, propane rubber line that they feed from the tank to the back of the stove. Um, I just surveyed a boat two days ago, and uh, he had uh, a propane tank in the back, which was fine. And he also had one of these little Newport propane furnaces in his cabin, and it was on, and it was kind of nice because it was kind of cold, and his cabin was nice and warm. So again, that has a shut off at the, at the little propane stove, but he also goes back and shuts it off at the tank manually. So it's, it's a matter of a, a process. Also, your tank should be secured. It shouldn't be able to roll around or, you know, if you're heeling over on your boat, you don't want to hear a clunk on the side. So there's, there's stands you can secure them on. Um, helm. Now, all these pictures, again, I usually take about 20 to 22 pictures. I, I, I like the insurance company um, and I like the buyer of a boat to see what they're getting. Uh, this is a picture of the, uh, the wheel steering, uh, compass, the instrumentation. The reason why I do this is because it's proof that it was on your boat. If your boat was ever vandalized, if somebody went in and stole all your equipment, you've got proof of what I had and that what your insurance company is going to have to replace. Okay. Uh, more, more instruments, temperature gauge, oil pressure gauge, uh, RPM gauge. Oh, let's go a little. This guy here, this is his deck. The boat had just come out of the water. He was just in the process of putting up the frame, uh, this sort of thing. I get down on my hands and knees and I sound the whole deck and I'm looking for any soft spots, uh, any excess moisture in the deck. If, <clears throat> if you're going to get moisture, uh, a little bit of moisture uh, in the core of the deck, uh, you'll most likely get it around the stanchions that hold the railings up. Maybe people are leaning on it and it gets a little loose and then those screws, a little bit of water can run down the screw and infiltrate into the core. All the core is, is basically, it's called a balsa core. It's compressed, glued sawdust and it comes in sheets and it's very flexible. That way they can get the curve of the cabin. They can get the curve and the slope of the deck because they put it, they put it down on the lower part of the fiberglass and glue it down and then gel coat over it. It doesn't take a lot of moisture. Um, I've been on some boats uh, where I'm walking along and it's like walking on a sponge and the deck is going up and down because the deck, the core of the boat is absolutely saturated. I haven't, in my 34 years, 
I've only walked off about four boats after being on them for 10 minutes. And I just said, this boat is a disaster. I, and I phoned, if the buyer isn't there with me, I'll phone him right away and I'll say, listen, I've been on this boat 10 minutes. I would not buy this boat. This is a disaster. I'm stopping the survey right now because it's already failed the survey and you won't be able to get insurance on it. So it's, uh, I don't go looking to fail boats. Absolutely not. I have minor findings and major findings. Even if I find a major finding, I will put a possible solution to fix that major finding in the survey. Touching up the bottom paint would be a, a minor finding. Um, cleaning up um, on your battery terminals. A lot of boats have two or three batteries on them. Uh, cleaning up uh, any oxidization or, or, or fuzz around your battery connections. Those are minor findings. Um, a major finding would be something that's dangerous, something that a person could injure themselves on, like falling through the deck, if it's that bad, uh, this sort of thing. Um, if, uh, if I run into a rotten hose on an engine, if it's soft and if it's not firm or anything like that, I'll say that this, this, is, this hose needs to be replaced before the boat is put into service. And then that's up to the owner of the boat or the seller of the boat to have that fixed so that when the guy or lady goes to get insurance, they can say, oh, this, this finding's been fixed and that finding's been fixed and, and this sort of thing. I normally don't come back to check it. I leave that up to the owner or the seller to complete and fix those minor findings. Um, Cockpit uh, area, portable barbecue, um, this sort of uh, equipment. You can see, uh, again, the boat had just been demasted a couple of days before, and he still hasn't got everything stored away, but uh, time was passing by, and we had to get it surveyed. This is the galley area of the boat. This is your propane stove and probably three burner propane oven and three burner stove, um, settee on one side, um, settee dining table on the other. Um, I, I, his navigation station is a mess right now, um, but it, it gives you an idea of the uh, dual voltage electrical panel. Um, one panel is 12 volts, the other panel is 120 volt uh, that you would get from a shore power cord or some of these boats have a generator on them. Some of these boats have solar and inverter as well. So it all depends on how the boat is decked out. And um, you can see here, this is the head. Uh, this is uh, underneath the dinette seats this is where the batteries were and i like to look at the batteries because i like to look at the connections i like to look at the wiring to see if it's done neat, nice and neat and um, also if if they're dirty if they need to be cleaned uh, if they should be sprayed with a solvent uh, um, let's see here that's a hot water tank there's a bilge pump here and you can also see here these Kielsen bolts that I was talking about, these big bolts that are coming up through the bottom of the boat and then they're screwed to hold that keel on. Some I've seen that were in terrible shape. They were very rusty uh, from sitting in water, uh, this sort of thing. And again, um, you know, clean them up, uh, put new bolts on them so you can put a wrench on them and they're just not gonna crush under the, the strength of a wrench. These, these should be torqued down with the proper torque, with, with the torque wrench, if they're loose. Um, just a picture of the berth, picture of uh, radio, some more equipment that was on the boat, uh, another closer shot here. 
of the electrical panel. It's all breakered. Everything is uh, on its own separate breaker. Um, more uh, equipment. This boat is very well equipped. Um, engine, which is usually under the steps as you're walking down the cabin. I'm not a diesel mechanic. All I have is a bit of know-how and a good set of eyes. And what I'm looking at is I'm looking at the serpentine belt. I'm looking at the hoses. I'm looking at the hose clamps. I'm looking around the injectors. I'm looking underneath the engine. If it's um, dark in there, um, one, of, one of my favorite, uh, favorite tools is a nice little flashlight. And I get in under, and I'm looking for any oil leaks or antifreeze leaks. All these diesel engines, probably 95% of them have, uh, right here, they have a closed cooling system where they, the antifreeze is in the engine all the time, and then the antifreeze is uh, cooled from the lake water. So they're quite easy to winterize, actually. Um, alternator, um, looking at, you can see here the front of the engine. Uh, right here is where the impeller goes, um, right up here. Uh, that's the Sherwood pump. And there's a little rubber impeller in there that should be changed every couple of years. And uh, it sucks the water up from the lake and flushes it through the, what, for lack of a better term, the radiator that cools the antifreeze in the engine. You can see here the motor mounts, uh, one over here, one over there. I like to have a look at them. I'll put a wrench on them to see if they're tight. Um, you can see here underneath the engine, it's, it's nice and clean in that area, um, which I find quite important. And this is a back a end of another boat at, uh, from here. I think I've done every 34, 34 Catalina here. Um, now, what I wanted to, so every survey I do has pictures like this of that boat that I survey that goes with the report. Um, this is a typical report of, that I do up. I'll just go through some of the headings here. Um, the owner, the date, the builder, the year of the boat, the, mar the model of the boat, length, now, length of a boat, there's about several, there can be three different lengths. There's the hull length, which is 34 feet, if it's a Catalina 34. Then there's the length of the water line, which is usually a good five, five feet shorter than the 34 feet. Then there's length overall. A lot of builders up until the early 2000s uh, didn't count a swim platform or a ball pulpit in the length of a boat. A 34 Catalina was a 34 Catalina. But now a lot of marinas are saying, no, 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 your boat isn't a 34. It's a 38, because it has to go in a 38-foot dock. So, you know, three different lengths of measurement on, on boats. Um, if, if anybody wants, I, I have some cards here. If anybody wants a copy of a survey, like I did this uh, on this 34. It's about eight pages long. It uh, encompasses everything that I inspected. You can see here, this is the equipment. Built-in swim platform, swim ladder, uh, and goes on and on. And then even the next page is you've still got more equipment here. And then I go into each thing I tested, the bottom, uh, this sort of thing. If, if you ever want uh, a sample survey, I don't mind emailing. If I'll give you, a, you can have a card. You can email me and say, 
can you give me a sample survey or give me an idea, send it to me by email so I can see what you do? Because uh, we'd be here all night if I told you everything I did <laughs> and started reading it all. So um, now I want to I want to stress a few a few things. We've already gone over the types of surveys and the reason people need them. Uh, most boats require their first survey at 15 or 20 years. Even as nice a boat as this, it's a 2000 boat. It's, it's 24 years old. Um, I, I surveyed it at 19 and I surveyed it again uh, because they were asking for another five year survey. It's the liability factor, as I mentioned, the insurance company have a million or two million dollars worth of liability on that boat. They want to know it's not a death trap and that it's not going to blow up in the harbor and take 10, 10 boats with it, uh, this sort of thing, which has happened at some marinas. Um, the main components that I'm looking at whenever I survey a boat Structural integrity. I want the boat to be solid. Then you've got your mechanical, electrical, and plumbing on a boat. It's just like a house. I'm, I'm basically a boat inspector. Some people are home inspectors. They go in and check your furnace. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the furnace is part of your mechanical part of your house. They check your plumbing, all this sort of stuff. Um, I mentioned measurements, uh, they're all over the board. Um, there is a website, um, let's see, there is a website that, uh, it's called Sailboat Data. And they've got on that just about every sailboat that's been built. And it's got all the intricate specifications, the years that they were built. Like, they don't make a 34 Catalina anymore. They make a 35 now. And one of those are $500,000. So um, the prices of new boats have gone nuts, both sail and power. COVID, those couple of years, uh, people were buying anything that floated. They just wanted something they could get on, get out on the water, throw the anchor, and not be around other people. Uh, there were a period of time, there were no boats, new boats being made. So people, if they wanted to move up from a 28-footer to a 35-footer, they had to look at the used market. Uh, another delightful thing was the, uh, uh, what I call the, the rich man's tax they put on boats, the luxury tax. Anything over 250, there's an extra 10% tax. Anything over 500,000, there's an extra 20% tax. So nobody's, n nobody's buying new boats anymore. Um, it's also this luxury tax that the government put on is also put on uh, any car over $130,000. Well, you say, well, who'd pay $130,000 for a car? Well, some of these cars like Mercedes and uh, these others, it's not hard to spend 120, and then, then they want 30% uh, luxury tax and people say, I'm not paying the government. I need a car, I'll buy something cheaper. And this is what's happening to the boat market. A lot of the boat dealers, whether they're sailboat dealers, power boat dealers, they're not stocking the big stuff anymore because they can't sell it. They'll only, they'll sell you one off the plan or off the brochure and then they'll order it and you'll wait six months to eight months for it. But they're not bringing it in and having it sit in their showroom for a year and a half and not be able to sell it. Um, Funny thing about the luxury tax, uh, one of the owners of a large marina that I do business with, he says, you know, it doesn't apply to motorhomes. And I said, well, he said, some of these motorhomes are eight hundred, nine hundred thousand dollars $900,000. And I said, well, why doesn't it apply to the motorhome? Oh, well, 
you can call that your home because you can live in one year round. <laughs> this, this is the absurdity of the luxury tax. You know, you can pay $850,000 for a vote or $600,000 for, for, for a vote, and they're, they're penalizing you for wanting to have a cottage on the water. And so, anyway, don't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> so, but this has put, this has put a lot of pressure on the price of good used votes. You figure a 15 year old vote now, what is that? Uh, we're in 2024. That's a 2010, somewhere around there, a 2010 vote? Yeah, a 2009 vote? My God, I consider that like a brand new vote up here. Who, who owns a 2009 or a 2010 vote? You know, and even a vote like this, uh, you know, it's 24 years old. But when you look at it, Four months a year's use, divide that, it's really only had about eight years of use. So, yes, sir. So, let's say I have to go in and replace my bulkhead. Your bulkhead? Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the dividing wall underneath where. And it, it's most likely wood. Well, it's plywood. And, yes. You know, that really nice looking marine plywood, and I use good one side fir. And you what? I use good one side fir. Yeah. Okay with you? Sure. As long as it's solid? As long as it's solid. I love you. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, uh, they, they, they used uh, marine plywood because they didn't, they thought it wouldn't rot. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, oh, marine, uh, marine plywood rots too. So you're, you're okay, you're replacing a wooden bulkhead that maybe had a, a leak coming down and it may have rotted a little piece. You take it out and put it on. This is, I don't want to go on. Um, I want to thank you for coming out. I know my presentation was only about 45 minutes, but if you've got any questions, if I can answer them, by all means, ask me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sure, and come on up and use the mic just because we are videotaping if anyone has oh, questions. Okay. Um, but I guess, Barry, I think you gave us a pretty good sense of what, how you read the kind of boat market, sailboat market at present. Um, and I guess along those lines, my boat is a 1990. Would you say there are general, what, what do you see in that generation of boats that are kind of the big things that are starting to maybe go in terms of maintenance? Or is there, do you, is there any big picture stuff on a boat of that vintage that you could? There's some boats that I would buy that were built in 1978, 77. You know, the old CSs, the old CNCs, they were built like Tanks, the fiberglass is that thick on them. You know, they, they'll never die if they're well taken care of. Um, we've, we don't build sail, we don't build boats in Canada anymore, basically. CS, CNC, um, Aloha, um, Whitby 42s. Uh, I have to phone down to the States to, to get a price on a new boat to, for a comparable, like I, I like to put in. And it's the same thing when I'm, I'm pricing. And I'm not shy. I'll, I'll, if a guy, if, if you went out and looked at a boat and you asked me to, uh, and if the guy was asking 150,000, I'm not shy. I'll say, hey, it's not worth 150,000. Uh, you know, here's, here's my calculations as to how much I think it's worth uh, based, based on the market. There's, there's always a lot of comparables out there that you can use. Um, one thing I'll tell you about the powerboat and sailboat from <clears throat> 1982 to 1990, those eight years were the most prolific years in the sale of power and sailboats, that eight year period. Why? <sighs> the baby boomers, you know, they were, um, they were in their 40s, you know? Their kids are getting older. Uh, double incomes. The wife's got a good job too. She's not home with the kids anymore. Let's go and buy a boat. So, you know, whatever, whatever your choice was. But those were really prolific years. Uh, questions, please. Um, what are the best brand boats you've seen? Right now? Uh, sale? <sighs> Well, I really like Catalina 
boats. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I, I like them. I've done a number of them, not just here, but at other marinas. They're, they're really well, boat, well built. Um, they, they use really good uh, uh, equipment. Uh, I've done 34s, I've done 36s. I personally, I, I like that. I like some of the older boats, um, the older CSs, the older CNCs. Back in the 80s vintage, uh, they had nice style to them. Um, and a lot of it too depends on what kind of boat you're looking for. Are you looking to leisurely sail? Are you looking to do a lot of racing? Are you married with three kids that are going to be on the boat on the weekends? So you need space. Uh, so there's, there's just so many options there. Any comments on the Aloha 8.2s? <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, the Aloha 28, right? Yeah. yeah. I was 34 years old when this country decided to go metric. Um, I had a hard time with metric. Um, you know, if you tell me, oh, I'm, I'm burning six liters per 100 kilometer, I'm thinking, what's your miles per gallon? <laughs> you, you know, and, uh, but the Aloha 28 was a really well-built boat, built down in Whitby. Um, I surveyed a few of them and uh, didn't find too many things wrong with them. Yeah, no. Yeah. So, uh, Barry, I'm kind of new to this whole sailing thing. I'm loving it. Sure. Uh, we're looking at uh, looking at maybe like a 22 to 26, uh, 1970 to 80 vintage type of boat. Uh, and this the survey thing is probably very important to get. It is. Uh, but what's sort of the price range you're looking for something in the, in those lines to do a <clears throat> survey? 25 footer? Tw 20, yeah, 20, anywhere between 22 and 22 uh, 26. To 26 is a pretty big range uh, in size when you're talking sailboat or mm -hmm. powerboat. Um, really, um, you could be anywhere from 5 to 13,000, 14,000, depending on the year of the boat, how it's equipped, what kind of shape the sails are in. One, another thing that I forgot to mention that I do is when I go and survey a boat, I look at all the soft goods. Does it have a dodger? Does it have an awning over the back deck? Does it have an enclosure? Because, and then I look to see what condition it's in and how long it's gonna last. Is it, you know, are the windows all fogged up? Are the zippers all broken? You know, cause that stuff costs money to get fixed. Uh, the interior of the boat, your soft goods, that sort of stuff. And I report all that, the condition of those things uh, in my report. What I'm looking for at an older boat for a buyer is what has to be spent on the boat now to bring it up to a good serviceable condition. So that's about all I can say. So what do you look for in an encapsulated keel? Do you look at the sails? Yes. And do you look at, uh, or what's an average uh, survey cost? I charge $13 a foot, flat rate. Okay? And I, I, don't, I, I don't count ball pulpits and swim platforms. <laughs> no, I'm a boater. I, I, uh, it's $13 a foot, flat rate, so. Yeah. We have a 2000 Hunter and what do you what would you see in it? Sell. What size? 2000 2000 I think. And what size is it? 2000 No, no, size. 31. Uh, Hunter is a decent boat. You know, it, it there's nothing wrong with the Hunter. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the Benetos. Uh, I've surveyed an awful lot of sailboats, and um, you know, uh, unless you've been really, really rough to your on your boat, um, 
like the, the, as I've said before, the usage that they get here and their care, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a privilege to own a boat and it's a lot of people's pride and joy. Always has been mine, so, uh, you know, I, it might be old, but I want it to look nice and, uh, you know, people say, oh, geez, that's your boat, that's a nice boat, but there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with a hunter, you know? Any, any other questions? Yes, sir. My friend had asked three questions and you answered one. Okay. So I'll ask the questions again. So when you're, you described the survey, you went into a, a lot of details, but do you look at the sales also when you're doing the survey? Uh, I'm sorry. I'll be honest. A lot of the times, the people have not brought the sails to the boat yet. If it's early in the spring, they may have put them in the sailboat or in the sail bags and taken them home. And sometimes in the fall, they, they're already. But I, I don't look at the sails, but I ask them, what do you have for sale? Okay, I've got a Genoa 150. I've got a Maine. Okay, they're Dacron. If um, you know, I've, I've, I've got a, a small. Uh, uh, storm and those jet. are included in the in in the description of the survey. Yes, and I I ask you bluntly. Okay, what kind of shape are they in? You know, uh, a buyer will probably. Well, the sales are going to be on the boat for the water test. And I've, I've done water tests for people. And um, they've had me come back and do the water test with them. And so we put the sails up and like, they're just like the person told me they'd be. The yeah. grommets are good, they're not all ripped and this sort of thing. So uh, the other question is yeah. that um, there's this boat that we have seen where the keel mm -hmm. is encapsulated. So there's fiberglass. Yes. What's your opinion of those kinds of, of, of keels? I just surveyed one of those two days ago at uh, Britannia. It was a 29 Alberg and, um, in 1985, and the whole keel is encapsulated with the hull, so there's no keel seam, there's no keel bolts, and then down in, in the hull, there's, um, the, the, the bottom of the keel had lead in it for about the first foot and then the rest, and then it had the, uh, the great big lead spigots for, for ballast in the boat. There's, there's no, and it was a full length keel, uh, which gave the boat, which would give the boat a good ride. And uh, I, I don't have a problem with that kind of a keel. Yeah. Just out of, curi well, just out of curiosity, have you seen boats with electrical motors? And battery yep. systems, like electrical powered boats, and, and what do you think of them? Electric boats? No, electric motors, like in, instead oh, of a diesel well, or a gasoline uh, engine. I hope they're not going too far. Hmm? I hope they're not going to go too far. Um, <laughs> no, I was just wondering, have you seen them? And if you would no, see one, what would there's you... A, actually, there's a company in Merrickville, Ontario, that are making electric boats right now. And uh, I haven't been in to, to see them. I know they're making electric outboard motors now and um, this sort of thing. And I'm also noticing that a lot of the boats, both power and sail, are, they're, they're putting uh, solar panels uh, on, on the top decks and some of them have the, uh, the davits going out over the back with some solar panels on them and that sort of thing. I think solar panels, if you've got solar panels that can help uh, keep the, and it all depends on your, how many batteries you want to put on your boat, which, you know, depends on how many hours you can, you can run it. But if you're sitting at anchor all day and if you've got two, 300 watt solar panels and, and it's a nice sunny day, uh, your batteries are going to be charged up by the evening anyway. So to a good 30, 40 amp inverter. It's becoming, it's becoming very popular in the Thousand Islands because uh, a lot of the islands that are government owned down there now, you're not allowed to run your generator, either in the bay and the moorings or at the docks. So a lot of the bigger boats are in power and sail. They're, they're going with the, uh, uh, with the solar package. You can get a good solar package for about 1400 bucks. These people aren't even using their generators anymore. So, anything else? Oh, well, it's been a pleasure.
Um, nice talking to you. Thanks very much, Barry. Oh, thank you very much. I'll put some cards here on the table, and if you ever want a sample of the survey, I, I'll send you one in the email. Um, it, it, it almost uh, denigrated into a, rally, a pep rally for the different boat manufacturers. Hunter, Benito, and like... Oh, yeah, yeah. I know the Catalina people were getting ready to... to uh, no, no. Riot I, there. It's at just, the end, I the think I've, I've surveyed more Catalinas up here than, but I think, uh, I don't know, I've surveyed an awful lot of boats. So I'd have to, I think I've got somewhere like 1,500 surveys on my computer here, so, you know, over the last number of years I've done. But, uh, Where do you live? I'm hard of hearing, so. Where do you live? I live in Canada. Hmm? 15 minutes, I can be here. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to cut, I've done so many surveys in the Thousand Islands because I was part owner of a marina. We boated down there for 30 years. Everybody knows me. I've got customers down there that I've surveyed two or three different boats for them over the years, but it's an hour and a half to get there, an hour and a half to back. I won't go for, for one boat anymore. I have to have two boats, so I'll leave the house at seven in the morning. I'm there at 8.30. I do one in the morning, I'll do one in the afternoon, and, but the, the, the drive's starting to get to me at age 74, so uh, especially with all those trucks on the highway. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you thought about a mentor, uh, mentoring program? I'm, I'm sorry? Yeah, I know, I, have, I know, it's a long time ago. Do you have, do you have um, like a mentoring program for like say someone young that wants to get into that? <sighs> I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're losing a lot of that experience, right? Uh, we're old. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're old. We're old. Uh, I can't, my wife saying, why are you still doing this? I say, because I love it. All the people I get to meet and the, the boat rides I get to go on, I said at the ball. So, you know, especially when they say, oh, can you come back when the boat's put in the water and do the water test? Oh, yeah, so, you know, I, t I took one boat. Um, it was during COVID, and the uh, American was buying, he was from Chicago, and he was buying this boat that was a Trident Yacht Club down in the Thousand Islands. So I, I surveyed it for him, and he couldn't get up to look at it. So he uh, depended 100% on what I uh, say. Uh, survey, beautiful boat, beautiful boat. And then the owner put it in the water, rigged it all, and then I, I sailed it for six hours, and then I took it to the Welland Canal for him and left it there, and he sent over a professional uh, American captain to take it through the Welland Canal. So, and all I got was great job, so. My dad, my dad owned a sailboat at Armdale Yacht Club. Armdale, oh yeah, I've been there. Yeah, very nice. I'm a maritimer, blue noser, through my and dad through. Is a maritimer. Okay. Thanks, guys.